Hey, hello everyone. This is criminal profiler Pat Brown. And today we're going to go back to 1995 to a very, very cold case in Maryland. Yes, still unsolved. Very sad case of a 17 year old girl by the name of Julie Ferguson, who disappeared off of a sidewalk outside of a mall after she got off of work. Uh, it is, <laughs> how can I explain this? This is a case that will teach you a bunch of stuff. One, don't always blame the police when a case doesn't get solved because sometimes it is so difficult and there are so many suspects. There are so many bizarre things that make no sense and that you can't even believe are true. All you can say with this case half the time is what the, and I'm going to show you why that's true. This is just, there's so many bizarre connections and things in this case. You just won't believe it. So stay tuned. Um, this is uh, going to be a real learning experience. Um, and before I start, I do want to say hello to everybody in the chat room. Uh, we have a full chat room here. Uh, let's see who's here. Wow. Uh, Christine is here. Annie is here. Uh, Lisa S is here. Lisa N is there. Oh, I like what Lisa N has to say. Getting ready for Pat's latest effort. It's an effort. <laughs> to show us all how to make the world logical again. Well, this has so many illogical things in this case. It can drive you nuts. And so uh, it's, it's, you're, you're going to see what I'm talking about in just a minute. It's, it's craziness. Carrie is also here. Um, did I say Lisa S? Uh, Joe is here. Um, and let's see what Alice is here. Benny is here. Uh, Annika is here. I'm not sure who I've missed uh, so far. So, and if I have, I'm sorry. And Carolina is here. Um, and if you would like to be in the chat room, please do join, join Patreon. Uh, let me show you about that. That's Patreon. Uh, you go over to the link below, join Patreon, five bucks a month. You can come to all of my live shows and be in the chat room and have a great time with our community. I have four Sunday shows every month. Usually it's on Sunday, um, uh, Kate, on a different case. And then I have four shows during the month that are hangouts or phone-ins where I talk about either all the cases in the news and you can ask me to analyze things and People call in and we have a great time discussing cases. So all of that is there. So you can always join that. Um, also, please do subscribe to the channel. It doesn't cost a penny and subscribing helps greatly. Click the like button, click the bell so you get notifications and share with your friends. And you can also support the channel by buying one of the books below. These are my books. Um, also, um, there's a dollar sign and you click on that. And you can just give a one-time help the channel. <laughs> okay, that's that. That's my thing I always have to do keep alive here. All right. So let's go to this case. Um, uh, well, hold on a second. Oh, there. I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought I was having technical difficulties already. Oh, this case. Oh, my goodness. So anyway, I this is one of the cases that I worked on early on in my career. I did not work on this with the police. Um, when I first started out as a profiler, I did a lot of pro bono work for families. And they would ask me to help because their the case of their loved one had gone cold. And the police, they thought they weren't getting answers from the police and they wanted an outside view of the case. So I did look at this one um, many, many years ago. Uh, I did talk to some of the detectives on the case. Some of them were great. Uh, we had really nice discussions. Um, they've since left and now a cold case squad has reopened this case. Um, still struggling to solve it. So... Let me tell you the basics of this case. Now, you can, and, and I, I do encourage this as a, as a matter of fact, um, if you haven't heard about this case yet, here is how you can hear about it. Um, this was done, I think it was this season. Uh, Paula Zahn came out with, she does on the case. And this, this um, one is called Blink of the Eye. And um, so you can find that if you have a Discovery Channel ID. So you can go there and you can watch the show. Um, and what you're going to see here today is way deeper than what you're going to see on the show. But the show does give you some nice basics. Um, if you don't have Discovery, uh, you can go here. Uh, at the top, you'll see Unsolved, uh, Maryland's Julie Ferguson case. That's by True Crime Daily. It's only, as you see, six minutes. It'll give you some very, very basic stuff. If you haven't heard about the case and you're watching this um, later, um, just stop the video, go look at that for six minutes and come back. Um, the two below, do not watch those, <laughs> especially the one in the middle. Oh my gosh, don't watch that. Um, this is what happens when a, 
a person who does uh, shows on teenage clothing tries to do true crime. You see a lot of hair flipping um, and, and a lot of misinformation. So don't go there. So just do the one for six minutes at the top or watch the 40 minute show with Paula Zahn. All right. Now, go away if you want to look at those, come back. Hi everybody. And whoever's in the chat room, I hope you did see one of those just because it gives you an idea of, uh, it just gives you a good, good flavor of the whole, the whole case. But you're also going to see that they didn't, they're not going to bring up what I'm going to bring up. And I have a lot of interesting information that's not in those shows. Believe me. Oh, I just hit my mic. Oh, let me ask you, can you hear me <laughs> before I go on? I forgot to ask the question. Um, can you hear me? Everybody let me know. I, nobody, nobody's trained well today. Usually you all tell me if you can hear me or not. Oh, good. Thank you, Lisa S. There we go. Lisa, Lisa's on the ball. Can see and hear you. Good. All right. Just wanted to be sure that was working. Okay, so now let me tell you a little bit about Julie Ferguson, and then I'm going to go through the different suspects in this case. And this is where it gets just beyond bizarre. All right, so this is beautiful Julie Ferguson. And she was 17 years old. She was a high school senior uh, at, a, at a school called Eleanor Roosevelt High School, which I actually taught in for half a year. I did uh, sign language interpreting for the student, stu students. So um, I worked in that, that school. Okay. So anyway, um, and then let's see, 1995, she was murdered. I'm trying to think how old my daughter was. My daughter was, um, 14 at the time. Um, and I, they were, my kids were homeschooled. And I, I think the next year or the year after that, when I looked into this case, my daughter was working at the other mall in town. There were two malls. I lived right near this place is Greenbelt, Maryland. Um, let me just give you, this is Greenbelt, Maryland. Uh, there's nice clouds. There's no mountains back there. And this is welcome to Prince George's County, Maryland in the city of Greenbelt. Um, I lived in the next town over, um, which is, you know, like one block. <laughs> so I, I spent a lot of time in Greenbelt because it's really, my town was like right up against it. So um, Greenbelt was pretty much where we did everything. Uh, and my daughter worked in a green belt uh, mall and a music store. And it, so there were like two malls. That was one she worked in. And then Julie worked in the other one. She worked at Linens and Things. Uh, and this is just a strip mall. It's got a, and there's a grocery store there, liquor store there. Not, not much thrilling, but you know, just basic strip mall. She worked in Linens and Things. And Eleanor Roosevelt High School uh, is considered the best high school in Prince George's County, Maryland. Not to say bad things about Prince George's County public school system, but it doesn't take a lot to be the best school in Prince George's County, Maryland. <laughs> um, there were two parts of the school. And this is kind of important to know, because when people hear Eleanor Roosevelt High School, they think of how many kids from there were in the science and tech program. And they were these brilliant kids who then went on to Harvard and Princeton and all of that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, th that program was at the school. And a, a lot of that program was in trailers outside of the school. So what happens is kids were imported in. You had to you had to take tests to get into that. And then they were terrified in the hallways <laughs> because they had to get through the hallways to their lockers. And that's where the regular kids were. Sorry, guys. I mean, I was, I, I'm just going to be truthful here. That's where the regular kids were. And I interpreted in that school. Um, and my deaf students were not in the science and tech program. Most of them are in regular classes. And let me tell you, I didn't work that hard <laughs> because the teacher didn't teach that much. Mostly she just looked at the class and said, classwork is on the board. And then the kids would just talk and she'd say, shut up, shut up, you know, do, do your work. <laughs> and at the end of class, she'd go, homework's on the board. So it wasn't a hard job. Um, now over in science and tech part, those kids were doing really hard work. You know, they were the ones doing calculus and physics and all of that. So there were like two sections of the school. I don't know which section um, uh, Julie was in, but so there were, you know, when people think of this top high school, they think of every one of the kids in the high school is like doing really well in life. Well, there was a lot, there were a lot of kids in the high school where <clears throat> weren't so great. <laughs> Let's put it this way. They had difficult, they had messed up families. Uh, there were kids who committed, you know, various crimes. There was drugs, all kinds of stuff was going on. Julie, her friends have said, 
And I do not know the veracity of what they're saying, but they're all saying she was the sweetest girl ever. She was not into drugs. She was not into anything bad. She was an only child of her mom. Um, and her uh, so she was just, this, they, the two of them lived together, her mom and her. Um, and they just said she was looking forward to college. She was a good student. There was no, nobody ever had anything bad to say about Julie, but that didn't mean she wasn't in a school with some questionable folks. So that will come into play in this case um, as to what happened to her. So let me tell you what did happen to her. So anyway, she worked at Linens and things and they closed about nine o'clock at night. So um, she was finishing up uh, in March of 1995. Um, and what happened was she, she got, she finished her job and she had bought a few things. So she had these, she had a couple bags with her and then she went, um, over to the liquor store, which is you know, right next door, to buy a drink, just a just a soda, not not anything, not anything that she shouldn't have been drinking. So basically, just a soda, and so she had a couple bags with her. And then what happened was, she had this couple girlfriends, and her friends were supposed to pick her up at about ten o'clock. And I think somebody's mother had died. There was a funeral that they were going to go to the next day, so they were making everything ready for that. She was, I think, she might have might be spending a night at somebody's house. So anyway, they were supposed to come at 10 o'clock and pick her up. The last anybody sees of her is 9.50 p.m. And she'd gone in the store to get the drink. Um, and there were these people that said they saw her talking to somebody in a red or burgundy VW um, kind of car was that, uh, not, a, not a bug, just a sedan, um, Jetta or something like that. Uh, she was like leaning and talking to them. Uh, it's kind of funny because all the suspects in this case that I know of are Caucasian and the people in the, in the vehicle were black. There was two black guys and a black girl. That's what they say. So I'm assuming somebody from her school. Um, they never were suspects. Just, just to point that out because that keeps getting thrown out in these shows that she uh, was talking to three people in a car. But since none of the suspects were black, I, <laughs> it's just kind of funny. It's like, and what does that even mean? But at any rate, this this red or burgundy Jetta, uh, Volkswagen Jetta, plays a part in this in this case like you wouldn't believe. So anyway, this is the last. Somebody said they saw this. Now, of course, the fact is we really don't know. We have a witness who says that, or a couple of witnesses, and you know, witnesses are always questionable. Did they see that that night? Did they see that? At, you know, an hour before, and it was a different person. Did they see that an another night? I, we don't even know. That's just what somebody said. What we do know is she bought this drink at the liquor store and 10 minutes later, she wasn't there. So when her friends arrived, this is what they found. They found her a bag on the sidewalk and the drink was on the sidewalk, still cold and frosty, just sitting on the sidewalk, but she was not there. And they were like, where's Julie? I mean, she wouldn't just leave her stuff on the sidewalk, but she did have, her purse was with her. The purse wasn't on the sidewalk. Um, but they're like, she knows we're coming to get her. So where is she? And then they wait a few more minutes and she doesn't show up. And the, they, they, they called, call the police um, pretty quickly. And there starts to be a search for her quite, you know, right away. So not much time had passed. Let me see uh, what more I can tell you about that. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Her panic friends notified her mother and the police. It became a murder investigation about seven and a half hours later. So this was 10 at night. And then what happened was, just down the road at this place called Daisy Lane. Now, Daisy Lane is not that far away. They say five miles away in this story I'm reading. I don't think it's five miles. I'm lying. I'm going to say less than two because I've, I know Daisy Lane really well because I spent a lot of time on Daisy Lane checking things out. So anyway, Daisy Lane, it's just like, you know, you come out of the shopping center, you drive straight down. It's called Greenbelt Road. It's a big road. Not, not, not huge, but goes past the high school on the left. And then just a little while longer, um, then you turn left into Daisy Lane. And it's kind of, um, at the time, was more of a kind of a quiet, small little road that just went back into some trees and stuff. And then there were a couple houses down that lane further on. And her, at five o'clock in the morning, her body was found on that lane. Um, she was found, this is what happened to her. She was found, let's see if I can get this out here. Okay, so this is, this is the area she's found in. Now it's, um, I don't think it was a park back then. Um, it was more of a field. Uh, and she's found, you can found down there. This is a, this is a crime scene photo. Um, 
Uh, somebody came and just basically dumped her right out. They keep showing the red car because they assume that it's the red car. Um, they found her. Uh, that's that. Uh, they found her shoe. She was fully dressed, by the way. She was fully dressed. Um, there she is, lawn. She can see Daisy Lane's coming down there. And then she saw in this little access road, that's where she was dumped. Um, she's lying on her left side. Her hands are actually tied behind her back. Um, and she's fully clothed, except that one shoe is off of her body. Um, there's another picture of that. Um, and there was blood there at, at the scene. There is blood on the ground. Uh, so you see there's all blood there and there's her shoe. Um, and they found bruising around her neck. And they also found a knife wound around her neck. And she had bruising and scratches on her, on her knees and on her hands. Um, and that's basically it. So when she was found, she, there was no sign of sexual assault. She wasn't, there, there was no real robbery involved in this. Um, somebody strangled her, tied her up and, and then cut her, cut her, cut her throat after they strangled her and then dumped her. And so there they are. That's, that's, that's what they had at that point in time and had no clue why she would get in somebody's vehicle because it's pretty clear that, um, her friends were coming to get her, right? <laughs> they were on the way. They were going to be there within a couple of minutes. So the question really lingers in people's minds. They're like, well, if she was about to show, they were showing up here, like and within minutes, why would she get in anybody else's car? And so I'll, I'll just ask, I'll ask people in the, in, in the room what they think about this. Uh, so I'll give you a chance to jump in on this before I go to the first suspect. Um, Oh, Lila's here too. Uh, what do you think, guys? So she's there, knowing your friends are about to show up, and there's other people. This is not an isolated location. Everything had just closed. There's some people around still getting out of stores. There's cars going through the lot. Uh, there was a restaurant in the lot. So there's people at the restaurant um, coming and going. Not isolated. Uh, no video cameras. That sucks. So that really was a problem. Um, Let's see, uh, <laughs> Ted Bundy. <laughs> no, he had a gold Volkswagen <laughs> and he was in California, not Ted Bundy. Um, <laughs> yeah, who else had a Volkswagen? Yeah, he's not actually not involved in this particular crime. Um, let's see, Carolina says, maybe someone said they were going to pick her up instead of her friends. Interesting, or maybe a cop said he needed her help. All right, I, I, I think that's good thinking. Um, I, I kind of like the one that said, we're, uh, we're, you know, you're, we're coming instead of your friends, because let's say they would have to, first of all, know that the friends are coming, though. That would be a problem. So I don't know why they would know that. But that's an interesting thought, because you could get away with that. You could say, oh, you know, your friends, they said we're going to meet them someplace. Um, I'm, we're going to I'm, I'm going to get you. So it, it's not impossible, but I don't know the, how they would know the friends are coming. Um, a police officer could pull up and say, hey, you know, I want to talk to you for a second. Um, possible. Okay. Um, do the friends have a red car? Uh, not that I know of that's never been brought up. So I do not believe they had a red car, but that is a good question because it could look just like the car, but pay attention to two things. What, what two things tell you that she wasn't just getting into the vehicle because it's, I think this is really important. Um, uh, Molly says maybe she was told there was an emergency with her mother. Possible. But, 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 um, there, this is what is weird. She left her bag taken by force. Okay. This is where I have the problem too. Um, she took, yeah, she, well, that's a good comment. Weird. She took her purse, but left her drink and shopping bags. Yeah. So she's sitting on the sidewalk, essentially having her drink, the shopping bag. She's leaving them there. She's not going to hold them while she's waiting for the car, right? She's having her drink, but she puts the drink down. And then goes over to a vehicle. Um, and either sits in the vehicle and the vehicle takes off with her, leaving therefore behind the bags and the drink. Or at that point, somebody grabs her and pulls her into the vehicle. It's got to be one of those two things. Um, clearly, she wasn't planning to leave. I think that's what's important about the bag and the drink. She didn't get into a car planning to go off with somebody or she would have taken everything with her. So she either sat down to chat with somebody 
Well, hey, your friends, oh, my friends are coming to get me. Sure, I'll sit and talk with you. And maybe she just sat there for a minute and then it all went bad. Or somebody opened the door and somehow got her in the vehicle and she had her purse over her shoulder. So that went with her, but but the bags and the drink did not. So um, hmm, asked for a cigarette. That's what, you know, cigarettes can cause a lot of trouble. But yeah, there's going to be cigarettes in the story, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and you won't believe about this cigarette story. So, yeah, I mean, that's an interesting one. Um, yeah, someone she was familiar with, and then it went south. And this is, these are all the things the police like racking their brains over because it was such a short period of time. But one thing they did know, she did get into that vehicle, whether she got on in willingly or not. She wasn't planning to leave. Uh, that's obvious, but she was taken away at that point. Um, and then taken somewhere. They don't believe that the Daisy Lane scene was the original crime scene. They believe it's a, there's a secondary crime scene where she was taken, something happened there, and then she was dumped in Daisy Lane. So that's kind of where it stands. So now let's go to the suspects in this case. We'll start with their number one suspect, and then I'm going to go through all the other suspects because this is just where everything gets so wacky. I'm telling you, the wackiest thing you're ever going to ever going to hear. All right. So now six months before this happened, there was another case. All right. And this case occurred in a, oops, sorry. Whoops. That's not it. That's not what I'm looking for. Uh, it occurred in a place called Laurel, Delaware. All right. Laurel, Delaware. This happened in 1995 as well, but this was in, wait a minute. This is September. This was, oh, Hold on a second, I gotta do it. This is six months later. Okay, this is six months later. Sorry, I got it backwards. March 1995 is when Julie went missing and ended up dead on Daisy Lane. Then September of 1995, there was another crime. And this is what brought this suspect into the Julie Ferguson case. So wait till you hear this. Okay, so the early hours of September 1995, 30-year-old Kay Robinson, also known as Brenda, Brenda Kay Robinson, uh, I, and she, we worked together for a really long time. Uh, she had called me, and it's funny because I worked on both of these cases. One I worked on for um, uh, uh, Julie's mother, Pat Ferguson, and then I worked with um, uh, 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 Brenda Robinson, also known as Kay Robinson. Um, she was asleep with her son, Nick, in their mobile home. At about around 1 a.m., Kay heard a knock on the door. Upon checking, she saw a strange man outside the door who claimed his car had broken down and needed to make a phone call. She offered to make a call but didn't let him in. Eventually, she asked him to leave. And uh, she did call the police in between because she was creeped out, but they didn't show up. Anyway, about an hour and a half later, she heard her door slam. Okay, so when she went out of her bedroom to check, she saw the same man in the kitchen with a knife. As she tried to get away, the intruder got hold of her and took her into the back room of the house. And the rest of this article is incorrect. So it always amazes me how this stuff gets written because it's not correct. Anyway, so let me let me go to my book because I actually have that in the profiler book. I do have this the story in here. Um, and I had it's called Vicky and Knock in the Night because I had to use a pseudonym. But I can say her name is Brenda Robinson now. OK, so. What actually happened was this. All right. He did torture her. He did not rape her. It says in this thing that he raped her. He did not rape her. He masturbated on her, but did not rape her. And she remembered, she thought, you did all this for that? <laughs> it, was, it was a thought. You wonder what victims think? That's one of the things she thought. Uh, and this, when she told me this story, it is... It, it really stuck in my head because it's how bizarre it was. I'll never forget when she said, he grabbed me by the hair, pulled my head back, and he took the knife and drove it into the right side of my neck. And there was this horrible crunching sound. And then he said, oh, shit, I broke my knife. And he dropped my head and left the room to look for another one in the kitchen. See, it's just hard to imagine that, you know? Anyway, he came back with a new knife, continued cutting her throat on each side, and when he thought she was dead, he pushed her off the bed, threw a blanket over her and left. The amazing thing, she was stabbed like, I think, 
let me see. I do think she was stabbed multiple times. I think it was like 20 times in her back. She was stabbed like 20 times in her back and cut on both sides of her neck. Um, and he had bound her at some point. And and he had threatened her with, with um, if you don't cooperate, I'll, I'll hurt your son. So that was one of the, the ways she cooperated with him. If you want to put quotes around the co-op, co cooperated. Okay. So anyway, she figured she was going to be dead. And um, so when he went, he came back. Um, and after he did his finally what she thought he thought she was dead, he pushed her off the bed. Vicky later remembered that her head hit the nightstand by the bed when she went down, but she didn't think much mattered that she'd hit her head because if this wasn't if this wasn't death, it wouldn't be long. So anyway, um, he he did leave at that point. She lay there until she was certain he was gone. Then this remarkable woman, bleeding to death, throat cut, stabbed many times, managed to get up. Despite the fact that her feet and hands were tied and her head, she couldn't even hold her head up because of what had happened to her. She managed to stagger to the telephone. She knocked the receiver off the hook, trying to call 911. Just then her son, who was pretending to be asleep during the attack, came out and found her. Seeing that her son was safe, Vicky muttered with her last conscious breath, go get help and passed out. Her terrified boy ran next door, banged and screamed until the residents came to the door and called 911. And they met, she miraculously survived this. It's just um, unbelievable. Now, <laughs> this this is where things start getting, I mean, that's weird enough, but it gets weirder. Believe me, it gets weirder and weirder and weirder. Okay, so a month later, this dude, Doug De Silva, they, this is, by the way, she gave a description of the guy, and this is the way the guy looked, all right? This is the, this was the, you know, the sketch they did, the composite. Then a month later, some say two weeks, two weeks to a month later, this dude shows up outside her house, outside her house. Now let me see what I wrote about that. Yeah, a neighbor called to report a suspicious person in Vicky's yard. He was sitting in a red pickup truck near Vicky's. I'm sorry, it's not Vicky. It's, it's Brenda, but I wrote Vicky in the story. So, okay, uh, near Brenda's home. Uh, the arresting officer noted that not only did the driver match the description of the suspect. Yeah, he sure did. But the composite drawing that the police sketch artist did was actually taped to the windshield of his truck. <laughs> so this dude has the composite taped inside the windshield of his truck. Um, he told the officer that he'd been visiting his daughter who lived in the same trailer park. And he just left um, and he uh, was saying a prayer for her. Okay, so they do photograph him, interview him and release him. Then they do a lineup. Brenda picks him out of the lineup of six people. Her son then goes to the lineup. The son picked him out of the six people in the lineup. So he is arrested. Okay. Now <laughs> he's arrested and he's in, in jail for a year. Um, but the line, the, 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 the identification, the witness ID is the only thing they have that the victim ID'd him and the son ID'd him. And he was sitting in her yard with a composite <laughs> stuck to his windshield. Okay. So you think that's pretty good, right? Well, you would think that's really good. Okay. So meanwhile, after a year, they, they, the only thing they had at the scene for evidence was some cigarettes and the DNA on the cigarettes did not match Doug De Silva. It didn't. So they let him go. Okay. Bull. So, all right. But then, so Brenda, she's like beside herself. She's talking to me and she's like, how could they let him go? I know it's him. I know it's him. Good Lord. It's him, you know, and they let him go. And he, you know, he was in the trailer park. He matches the composite. I was with him. It's him. Right. Okay. Now it gets weirder. Oh no, no. You think this is weird? It gets weirder. Okay. So meanwhile, <laughs> While he is uh, there in, in, in custody, the, the Julie Ferguson case goes down, right? Yeah, it does. And he's chit-chatting with the, with, the, with, the, with the detectives, right? And he says this interesting thing. Now, I don't know if you remember my recent case I just did. Do you remember this case I just did? The Darlene Krashuk case? Darlene Krashuk was murdered in Colorado. She was in the Army. And she was brutally murdered. She went to a club. She came out. Her body was found in the parking lot, nearly nude. Um, 
brutally murdered, um, terrible sexual homicide. And um, while Doug De Silva, okay, let, let's get, keep all the people straight here. While Doug De Silva is in Delaware talking to the investigators, he says, he says, oh, and tell Betty Crashock, tell Betty Crashock, I'm sorry, hold on a second, tell Betty Crashock, the mother of Darlene Crashock, tell her I'm really sorry about her daughter getting murdered. So the dudes in Delaware are going, you know Betty Crashock, the mother of the girl who was murdered in Colorado? And he says, you yeah, can believe this. He says, well, yeah, my ex-wife and uh, and Betty and uh, my ex-wife and uh, Betty Crashock, the mother of Darlene, we all used to live together. And you know where they lived together? They all lived together on Daisy Lane. <laughs> They live together on Daisy Lane. So now this guy, they think he killed or tried to kill Brenda Robinson in Delaware, where his, I think, I don't know if his wife lived there or his daughter, daughter, I think his daughter lived there in the trailer park. So now he he's a suspect in that crime. Then he says, Oh, and tell Betty Crashock, the mother of Darlene, who was just killed in Colorado. I'm sorry about that, because we all used to live together on Daisy Lane. So, so then they ask him about Julie Ferguson and he goes, yeah, I know Julie Ferguson. I go to the Greenway shopping center all the time. I've seen her out there. Uh, yes. And you remember that red car, that red vehicle? Guess what? He had that red vehicle. And on top of that, they had found some like white dog hairs on Julie and they asked him about different things about himself. And he said, oh, yeah, I used to have these white boxer dogs. And by the way, I got rid of my vehicle. I crushed it. I took it to the junkyard and got it crushed. <laughs> so do you think he's a good suspect? <laughs> now, now, if you watch my show from last week, you do know, what you do know is that this guy, they finally did DNA on the same cigarette. So we have cigarettes again, right? So the DNA on the cigarettes from this scene matched this guy, Michael White, who was uh, in the army with, with, with her in Colorado. So clearly, Doug De Silva did not commit that crime. At the same time, they're having issues with Doug De Silva. Um, you know, he's not, he didn't match the DNA on the cigarettes at this scene either. So what the heck? So anyway, but they still suspect him. I mean, they do because they, they just, who, who could it, else could it be? <laughs> well, let me tell you who else it ended up being because here we go. We're, things get weirder and weirder. All right. Here they, got, they do the DNA and it finally matches somebody. It matches this dude. <laughs> they might as well be twins. Look at it. This guy's named Mark Eskridge. Look at these two guys. Can you believe it? I mean, they're both. Now, who is Mark Eck Eckridge? Okay. So anyway, he actually matches the DNA. So he pleads guilty to Brenda K. Robinson's rape and attempted murder. She wasn't raped. It was sexual assault. She wasn't raped. Um, he got an, a, a life sentence, an additional 20 years, and he's, he's in Cumberland, Maryland. He was already in prison, by the way. Um, he was uh, matched in 2005. This is now, yeah, 10 years after... The, the, the attack, 10 years after, the DNA matched 43-year-old already in prison. So that's where CODIS helped. They put it into CODIS and it matched the guy in prison. Uh, he was in prison for another rape in Maryland. Well, not another rape, another sexual assault, a rape in Maryland. And it turns out that this guy, what the, the, when the DNA matched him, it turned out he had actually lived in that same trailer park. <laughs> so both these guys were in the trailer park. This guy was visiting. This guy was living there. They both look pretty much alike. And this guy sitting out in their yard doing prayers with this stuck to his. I mean, think about if you were a police detective, would you not think this guy is guilty? 
can you possibly believe that with all of that, it turns out to be this guy? <laughs> can you believe it? I mean, is that the weirdest thing you ever can imagine? I mean, it, it's freaky. But, okay, so now we know he didn't kill, this guy didn't kill D Darlene Crashock, although he did know the Crashocks, and he did live on Daisy Lane. We also know he didn't attack Brenda Robinson. This guy did. So now there's two crimes that he sort of has connected himself to um, that he didn't do. But he does live, he did live on Daisy Lane and have a red vehicle and some and some white-haired dogs. So if he didn't do the other two crimes, did he actually kill Julie Ferguson? Okay, so now we're back to Julie. Did he kill Julie Ferguson? Um, because he didn't do the other two, doesn't mean he didn't do the Ferguson crime. Uh, or, or is it just this guy has like the weirdest freaky luck ever and he matches things he shouldn't match and he says things he shouldn't say and he just happens to be in places that you can't believe he's been in. I mean, it's phenomenal. By the way, he has disappeared. Um, hasn't been seen in 16 years. Uh, a true crime daily did talk to his daughter, April. Um, and he, she doesn't know where her dad is. Um, so he's gone missing <laughs> three, three years after, uh, uh, um, Julie got murdered. Uh, he went missing and nobody seems to know where he is. So that's kind of interesting too. Who knows what happened to that dude, but he's still a suspect obviously, because it's hard, to, it's hard to ignore him as a suspect. It really is. But I'm going to get into the other suspects in just a minute. Oh, my goodness. Uh, <laughs> um, they are, well, they're mugshots. Well, the same frowny face. Yeah, they're all, but they're all mugshots. That's true. But it, it is amazing. Everything is so similar. The hair, eyebrows, everything is so similar. It's crazy. Um, it really is. Uh, I was going to mention something else about, oh, um. Yeah, so he's, he's gone missing. He, he has gone missing, but, but he is still a suspect. All right, so what about the other suspects? Well, let me tell you about another suspect I personally know. So so I had this friend, um, and she no longer is with me, a very sweet person. Um, or, and she, she met this fellow who also played Scrabble. We're all Scrabble players. And she met this fellow who played Scrabble. And the guy was kind of, well, what can you say? He played a mediocre game of Scrabble, um, and but she 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 had cancer at the time, and then she met this guy, and he was really nice to her. So they hooked up, and he became her fiance. Um, and so I got to know him too, but I always thought he was a wee bit off, shall we say, like really peculiar, and things about him made me question uh, whether he was, you know, didn't have a severe personality disorder. Um, and uh, so I was always very cautious around him. And so one day he says to me, uh, you know, I know Julie Ferguson. And I'm like, oh, no, not you, too. And the guy was a security guard. And I always say security guards are number one serial killers. And I'm like, what? You know, so anyway, apparently, oh, yeah, I know. I know Julie Ferguson, too. And he said that his son um, was friends and had gone, was in the same grade as Julie Ferguson. They 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 hung out together, his, and then his son ended up in jail. And I can't remember why. And it's been a long time. But anyway, he claims that he was in the shopping center the night she went missing. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, really? So now I'm thinking, are you are you a serial killer or are you covering for your son? I'm like, everybody knows Julie Ferguson, and everybody was in the parking lot. <laughs> but nobody knows who killed her. I mean, where can you get it? That's another weird one. Okay, so now let me move on to the next suspect. So this is another one you won't see on the show. Uh, this, this, this is, <laughs> oh, this is, this is kind of true. Annika says a lot of creeps prey on vulnerable, needy people like cancer patients. Yeah, I mean, you know, she, she was really struggling and, um, she, you know, he, he was will, you know, he was willing to be there for her, you know, and so yeah, and it's funny because you know after she died, he always considered me the best of my, his friends, which I never quite understood. Um, but 
<laughs> I knew him for years after that. And he did continue to say really creepy things. And um, and he died on last year as well. So we'll never know whether he's involved in the, the, the murder of uh, Julie Ferguson. But I don't believe he was. I think he's just one of those big talkers. But just when he said that, I'm like, oh, not another one. <laughs> you know? But OK, let me go on to yet another one, though. All right. So Julie Ferguson was in, she was 17 years old, and there was another girl she went to school with who was a, she lived in the next town over, um, and her dad lived next to a woman who was murdered, okay? Let me see if I can pull this one out, because this is another really strange one. So this woman, let me find it here. Okay. Her name is Val, and the book is, I call her Deborah Joshi, but her name is not Deborah Joshi. It's Valerie Lamonsing. Uh, and she was stabbed 17 times in her living room. She was not raped, but her husband found her dying on their living room floor. A few pieces of jewelry and a big plastic container of quarters were stolen. Her vehicle was also missing. Um, one of the most fascinating things about where the vehicle was missing, the vehicle was stolen from the house. Uh, and was driven to a nearby shopping center, not the shopping center she was found, disappeared from, but another shopping center was about, I would say, that might have been three miles away. Um, and where that shot, that where that vehicle was found, I had a serial killer suspect living two blocks to the left, two, two blocks, one direction from there, and the other direction, another two blocks, the other direction. Guess who lived there? Yeah, Doug De Silva. You betcha, Doug De Silva. <laughs> And I'm like, no, not Doug De Silva again. Now he lives two blocks away from a vehicle that was taken from a different crime scene, from the Valerie Lamonson crime scene. Okay, so <laughs> the guy's everywhere. I mean, this was what I want to tell you sometimes that sometimes suspects will just be in, in an area with so many crimes that they keep popping up and look like they're linked to everything, and they're not. So it gets very tricky. So anyway, so what happened was the, the husband was their chief suspect for a long time. According to the police, uh, Valerie came home from work in the afternoon and changed to more comfortable clothes. Her husband was not at home and they didn't have any children, so it was just the two of them. The next door neighbor, this is the father of the girl who went to the same school as Julie, told the local newspaper that her SUV flew out of the driveway that day. They had two dogs and the dogs never barked, according to this man, the neighbor. I'll just call him the neighbor, okay? He was working in his garage on a project and he responded to the sound of a car by looking through the windows of the garage door. So he was inside the garage working on a project. This is very important because you'll see what happens next in this. He saw what looked like a black man or at least a dark man behind the wheel. Okay. Deborah was black. I'm sorry. Valerie was black. And when I went to her house, I expected her husband might be as well. However, uh, Laman Singh is an Indian name, and he was a Trinidadian Indian. So he they he was from Trinidad, and Trinidad has a lot of Af uh, uh, black people there, but they also have a lot of Indians there. Um, so he actually had lighter skin. She was she was African American. He was more looked more like East Indian. Uh, so he had lighter skin. Um, it is possible that he might be mistaken for a black man if he were seen driving by very quickly. The SUV was found a mile away in the neighborhood strip mall, the, and the plastic container that held the quarters was found in an apartment complex parking lot across from the mall, but the quarters were gone. Nothing else was ever discovered. Now, the logistics didn't support uh, uh, Valerie's husband as a suspect. He would have had to leave his vehicle at the strip mall, walk home, kill his wife, then take her vehicle back to the strip mall, get in his own car, and then drive back to the scene. She was already, she was dying when the ambulance arrived. If he did it, he would have wanted to make sure she couldn't speak and would have made sure she was dead. So he actually called the ambulance. So, I mean, if he stabbed her up and then took her car away and then walked back, I mean, why would she still be alive? There was no evidence ever found in his vehicle. Also, there was no blood evidence ever connected to him. And one would expect if a woman stabbed 17 times, they, uh, they, the, um, the husband would be, you know, there would be something connecting him. All right. So he would have had to uh, uh, commit the perfect crime, essentially. So anyway, um, they did not get any further with that. So then we, no, there was no evidence. So they sort of just gave up that. Anyway, so I went uh, to 
to find out a little bit more. So I decided I would interview the neighbor whose daughter <laughs> went to school with Julie. Right? Okay. Okay. So I go interview the neighbor. I knocked on his door and said I was there to ask questions about the, the murder next door. Come on in, he said. He had a glass of scotch in his hand and was smoking a Marlboro cigarette, the kind that was found outside the window at the crime scene uh, and a brand that was not smoked by the Lamont Sings. Another coincidence, but it was a popular brand. Uh, he welcomed me into his house, chit-chatting about this and that quite friendly, but he quickly turned the conversation to a sexual note and I became uncomfortable. I was, this was 1995, <laughs> a lot younger, okay? A lot younger. Um, so he says, so what's a gorgeous woman like you doing in the detective business? I'm a lucky guy to have a sexy guy like, a sexy girl like you show up on my doorstep. He leered at me and I was wondering what the hell? This, why is this guy making sexual innuendos? I'm coming here to talk about a murder. This was creepy. I noticed when it came to the front door, he went behind me, let the dog out and then shut the door and made sure it was locked. That seemed innocent enough, but then he walked to another door and locked that one too. That's when I started getting like something's, something's not right here. And I started wondering what the heck was going on. He talked about the crime and walked me to the garage where he said he would show me where he was when the murder happened. He reminded me that he hadn't heard the dogs bark when, when Valerie was being assaulted. And I thought to myself, well, did the dogs not bark because it was the husband who committed the crime or did the dogs not bark because they knew the perpetrator like the next door neighbor, for example. He says, while we're in the garage, I saw the car fly out of the driveway and I saw this black man, well, dark. Well, it could have been the husband. So my mind was racing as he put the garage door down to set the scene. He actually, it would, the door was up when I came in. He lowers the door. Okay, so now I'm in the garage. The house is locked down. Now I'm lo locked in the garage, essentially. <laughs> Get this. He turns to me and he says, don't worry, I'm not going to do anything to you. Who says that? <laughs> really? Who says that to somebody? So I got this very bad sense of dread, you know, at that point. Then I looked at the windows on the garage door. Now, remember, he was supposed to be in there working on a project. And if you're working on a project, you'd have lights on in the garage, wouldn't you? And when you have lights on inside, it's hard to see outside into darkness. So that right there is a problem. But then I noticed that the windows were so smeared. They were so smeared. They hadn't been washed in years. There was no way that that man could look through those windows and even see the vehicle, much less somebody in the vehicle, much less what, what color his skin was. So I knew at that point the dude was lying. And I realized I was now locked in a garage with a guy who's lying to me about what he saw. And what I did was I had my phone out and I pretended I had dialed my office and I pulled, turned around and I, and as he turned to face me, I said to my, into my phone, which I had not actually dialed anything because I didn't have time, but he didn't know that. I said, oh yeah, I'm over here at Mr. And I gave his name, the house next door to the, the Lamon Sings. I'm right next door. Um, yeah, I should be finished with the interview in about uh, 10, 10 minutes or so. So I'll be back at the office by 530. And when he saw me do that, he looked at me and he said, you can go now. He went, took me straight to the front door and kicked me out. Interesting. I, so that was creepy. Uh, that case is the, the case of Valerie Lamonsing has never been solved. I don't know if they, I, I, I gave all that information about the neighbor to the police. I don't know if they ever looked at him. And then, of course, I thought about Julie Ferguson. He was creepy and his daughter went to school. Well, Julie Ferguson, I didn't know about his car. I can't remember if I looked into his car. Maybe he had a red one too, but that was another suspect that popped up. And uh, so now that was, a, now we're, we, you know, the suspects are like adding up, but that's not all. We've got more suspects. <laughs> and this is where it gets, uh, this is, this is, this would be true. Um, Annika says, I could see her trusting a friend's dad to get close to or even in the car. This is possible. Uh, somebody could say, you know, the guy could pull up and say, hey, you know, oh, I'm, you know, I'm so-and-so's father. Oh, yeah. You know, you're waiting on your friends. Oh, yeah, I'm waiting for, oh, I, I, my, my daughter. Are you going to go? Why don't you sit down and chit chat with me for a sec? She opens the door. He opens the door for her. She sits down in the right door thinking she's just sitting there. That's why she leaves her stuff on the, 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 the sidewalk because she's not planning to go anyplace. And then he just 
hits the gas and drives off with her. That could be. So it could be a dad in there. It could be, or it could be a who. We don't know. So now well, let's see who else they had for a suspect. And I have yet another one here. And I don't think they have, I think I, I turned this information to the police. So they should have this suspect too. But I'm going to do, they've got two in the show. And then I'm going to do my last one here. And I'm going to go see how many of you think who did what. <laughs> okay. So they had this next person. They called this guy Victor. And I I, I don't know that it's, that's his real name. Um, I'm going to guess it isn't because they might want to use, a, you know, a pseudonym if the guy hasn't committed lots of crimes. Victor, a local high school student, had gone into linens and things. Now, and and... and and he had given that credit card to Julie. This is like two weeks before she was murdered. It was declined. And so Julie confiscated the card. And he got enraged. And he told her he would kill her and leave her by the side of the road. <laughs> that seems kind of clear, doesn't it? Anyway, the law enforcement showed up and they interviewed this dude. And he said he was home being punished by his parents. And they'd taken his vehicle away from him. And I, I didn't get in the show what color the vehicle was. So he couldn't, but he couldn't vouch for his whereabouts. Supposedly, even though they'd taken away his car, he was allowed to leave the house. And he supposedly left the house alone and went and hung out with some people who claim he hung out with them. They never came up with anything else. And he said, oh, I never was, I never really uh, yelled at her like that. That's, that's, they're, they're exaggerating that. And then they said this other thing that he was infatuated with Julie, this Victor guy, right? And he kept this photo of her on the dashboard. <laughs> Does everybody walk around with composites on their windshields and photos on their dashboard in this case? So this guy supposedly has a photo of her on the dashboard. Uh, <laughs> so that's another creepy dude. So that's Victor. Okay. And he wanted to date Julie, but she wasn't interested. They couldn't link him to the crime. I'm going to say he was a pretty damn good suspect, though. <laughs> oh, this is, wait a minute. Beth says, this is crazy. I have to go, but I can't wait to catch the rest of this later in the week. Isn't it? Yes, it is crazy. It's totally crazy. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, What's who? Uh, Beth says, Annika, especially a good kid who trusts adults. Yeah. If she got into it, if an adult came up there, like maybe my Scrabble dude, <laughs> maybe it was him. Uh, she would, she might sit down and talk to him while she, she's waiting for a friend. She's just hanging out. Um, it was March. I don't know how cold it was outside, but you know, it's 10 o'clock at night. Maybe it was getting chilly. And he said, why don't you sit in the car while you wait? Maybe she did, you know, I'm okay. I'll just sit down. Could be an older fellow, could be a, a father or a friend. It could could well be, or it could just be some other guy who just says, "Hey, you waiting for your friends? Hey, you know, we, you know, she knows him from school, and she sits in his car. That could be too." Um, last person to see her from the liquor store, maybe someone had a crush on her. They didn't link the liquor store people to her at all. That does not seem to be anybody. Um, oh, that's interesting. Uh, Lila says, that's how Ariel Castro abducted Michelle Knight. He was the father of a classmate, so she accepted a ride. Yeah. And that, you know, the trusting thing can really do you in. Um, so anyway, let me tell you about the next suspect. Okay, this guy is called, his name is Noel Smith. All right, where's Noel? Uh, yeah, uh, Noel, where'd you go? Hold on a second. Do not be missing Noel Smith. Uh, Noel went missing. Hold on a second. And why didn't Noel want to come up here? Hold on a second. Uh, here he is. Okay. Show up, Noel Smith. All right. For some reason he didn't he didn't come into my background. Okay. Here we go. There's Noel. All right. This is Noel Smith. Hey, he's a creepy dude. Oh, another creepy dude. <laughs> you know, what's weird is that Julie's the nicest person, supposedly, and everybody loves her, and she's so sweet and wonderful, and she's got all these guys all over her, the creepiest fellas ever, including some older creepy dudes. I mean, it's the weirdest thing. Anyway, this creepy dude, his name, they gave his name because he's in prison, <laughs> so they're not so worried about him. His name always came up. He was, he had assaulted women, 
and beat people and was a menace to society. He had told a friend he was interested in dating Julie, but she was not interested. <laughs> she turned on a lot of dates, that poor girl. Um, he continued to pursue her and came out to the store to ask her just to ask her out just weeks before. So along with the Victor dude, this dude also shows up at the store and has an argument with her in the store. I'm like, I'm kind of surprised the manager didn't fire her. You know, it's like, Julie, you're a real nice girl, but how come all these dudes come in and keep wanting to date you and keep, you know, yeah, making my store look bad? You know, weird. He was a regular visit. And, okay, and he's a regular visitor to Daisy Lane. Seriously, he knows Daisy Lane too. And he raced cars up and down Daisy Lane. He didn't own a car himself, but had access to a friend's car, which was red. So now they're trying to, they, they got this tip that he'd asked a female friend to be an accomplice to a murder. I mean, that's, that's a little weird thing to ask your friend. Um, you know, hey, I, 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 this girl, you know, she won't date me. So would you help me grab her and then I'll go kill her? I mean, that's kind of weird. Uh, I, kinda, I find that hard to believe. Um, but that's supposedly so. And then it says this could be the three people that they thought they saw in a red car in the parking lot. Well, the red car supposedly had two black people and a, and a, a two black guys and a black girl. And that dude is not exactly black, but maybe he had a, two black friends. I don't know. And they didn't actually see him. Who knows? Um, but then he supposedly was home with friends, uh, not home, but he was with friends watching TV and they backed up his alibi. However, he seemed nervous and the story was vague. So they, and they, but they never changed their story. Okay. Meanwhile, he is uh, behind bars for an unrelated drug charge. And while he was in prison or the jail, an inmate said he bragged about murdering Julie. He denied it. All right. So, and he's still, I think he's in, he's still in jail. So he's got, he's got a lot, he's got a rap sheet that's really long. Let me tell you. So he's still a suspect and they still think he, he's a good suspect. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> Well, actually, there's hardly anybody on Daisy Lane. There were just like, the, the Daisy Lane was mostly empty. And then there were just a couple houses there. And one of them was, I think, Doug De Silva, where Doug De Silva lived. But, but you know, there's kind of a cut through area. So that people would cut through there whipping along on cars. I guess that that is possible. Um, <laughs> great tattoo. You could play Scrabble on it. Mm, that's possible. I don't see any uh, special squares, you know, triple triple words and all that stuff, you know. <laughs> um, okay, so now that's not it for the, the, the suspects. Here's another one. All right, this guy's name is not in any of the shows. I got this call in from somebody, and this guy, the first the show, the, the, the call came in from a guy who said, I know two different women who are married to the same guy, and they both think he killed may have killed Julie Ferguson, and they both think this guy is creepy and they're scared to death of him. Now Let's see. Should I start with this um, from my files here? All right. Mm -mm -mm. Okay. This guy, <laughs> and not this guy. So let me let me take his picture away. Now, I, I I always wondered whether it could be the Victor guy they were talking about, and I guess it could be, but um, I I don't know uh, if that's the same guy. It doesn't quite sound like the same guy, but maybe it's the same guy. All right. This one. Yeah. They were married in 1998 and they went to Liberty University in Lynchburg. OK, um, he knew Julie in high school. I hardly knew him at all when we married. OK, they've been getting together a year. He had a tattoo on his arm. There's a tattoo thing going on here, too, with cross with cross and flowers that said in loving memory of Julie Ferguson. <laughs> what the heck? He said they dated in high school. He is bipolar and gets into these rants and would say, when he hurt me, he saw red when he came to, I'd be on the, oh, wait, wait a minute. He'd get into fights with her, I guess. He would say, I would never be the real Julie. One time choking me, hand over my mouth and nose, he said in a sing-song voice, we are killing Julie, we are killing Julie, isn't this fun? He also had a picture of Julie on the dresser. And flowers like a glass vase and picture and a glass covering. <laughs> That's a scary guy to be married to. And he said, you don't know what I'm capable of. And apparently took the first wife, the first wife, um, to the site where Julie's body was found. 
Mm, I guess it's just where you take your your wife to for a nice uh, outing in the afternoon. Um, he said that Julie had gotten in, involved with the wrong guys and she was a slut and she got punished for what she was doing. And he also told the first wife, I got away with it and I could get away with it again. Yeah, that's an interesting dude. Oh, the guy gets worse. He went to a mental hospital during, uh, he was admitted to the mental hospital while he was in high school and after Julie's death. Supposedly tried to kill himself after Julie's death and later tried to kill himself with Tylenol and then was put back in the hospital and then tried to kill himself again. Uh, hmm. I did ask if he had any dogs, you know, like with white hair and, and they told me he had had a boxer with a white belly. Hmm. That was interesting. Um, couldn't find out about a red car. Um, pathological liar. Did drugs. Uh, I did have a best friend who was black, so maybe that, no, no, that's the second guy. See, this gets really confusing. <laughs> oh, whose guys, who who was with who as far as friends went to, and who could be in the red vehicle that people thought they saw three black people, but who knows if they ever did. Um, <laughs> and if that vehicle had nothing to do with the crime whatsoever, because again, none of the suspects are even black. So um, now, now, Eleanor Roosevelt School is a very mixed racial school. Um, everybody's friends with everybody. PG County is like that. Um, this is one of the counties where pretty much, you know, all races, at least a, when I, my kids were growing up, people got along really well. So it was a very mixed race county. Um, and so that was cool. Um, so I don't know if this guy is the victor they're talking about, or this is a yet another guy. I think it's yet another guy. I turned this information into the police because three people talked to me about this guy saying, having Julie tattoo and the picture on the bed stand and saying we are killing julie we are killing julie which the guy is obviously nuts but the question is is he did he kill her uh and we don't know so doug de silva is missing he's been missing for 16 years did he kill julie well finally did he finally kill somebody he didn't kill everybody else everybody thought he killed but did he finally kill somebody and kill julie or was it my scrabble playing friend or her son or was it the guy next door to the other murder who was creepy as all get out, whose daughter went to school with Julie, or was it the Victor guy? Or is it the Noel Smith guy? Or is it this guy? Look how many suspects there are. It's insane. And the only thing they're hoping because she wasn't sexually assaulted is that there were some, I think there was cigarettes there also at the scene. Um, I think they're hoping with the new, uh, are there cigarettes? I can't remember now. Um, with a new DNA technology, and they're going to do all the touch DNA and stuff, which, of course, again, can be completely wrong because, you know, if you're going to high school and you're walking around in the hallway, all kinds of people can touch you. So theoretically, a lot of these guys could have touched her and had nothing to do with the actual scene. So will they ever be able to figure out through DNA who killed Julie Ferguson? I don't know. Uh, but of course, they, 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 keep, they keep trying. And I just think this case is an amazing case. It shows you how convoluted, how, how coincidental. When people say there are no such things as coincidences, yes, there are. <laughs> I hate to tell you, there are. There are things like coincidences. I mean, Doug De Silva didn't kill uh, um, Darlene Krashuk out in Cal Colorado, even though he knew the family and lived on Daisy Lane. He didn't kill Brenda Robinson, even though he was in the trailer park with a composite on his window and he looked just like the guy. Did he kill Julie? I don't know. Who did? I don't know. And that's where the, the police, you know, sometimes we're so rough on them and the families are rough on them and say, why aren't you figuring out who killed Julie? Well, I don't know. Maybe because half the town looked like they've tried to kill Julie. I mean, and here's this, what appears to be a totally sweet, innocent girl. And yet everybody is trying to kill Julie. I mean, there could be a, I mean, that, that would be a heck of a movie, you know. We're here, we're here. We're all here to kill Julie, but all at different times. Craziness, craziness. Um, uh, oh, <laughs> wait a minute. What's this? Reticent Robin says, hi, I'm going to change my name to Robin. <laughs> okay. Well, no, you're not reticent anymore. <laughs> I'm starting from the beginning and listening while I make dinner. I like to help people make dinner. Um, <laughs> lock them all up. Maybe need, uh, maybe need a law where the three best suspects go to jail. <laughs> You know, and, and you can see why 
the wrong person can go to jail. I mean, Doug De Silva was in jail for a year for a crime he did not commit, but you can't really blame the police for arresting him and you can't blame him for believing it. And Brenda thought for sure it was him. I thought it was him. I mean, when they let him go, we were all like, what the heck? And then when they arrested this uh, Eckridge guy, I'm like, we're all like, oh, you got to be kidding. The guy's a doppelganger. And this is the same thing that happened to Stephen Avery, mind you. So Stephen Avery are making a murderer. When he got his first arrest, that dude, the woman identified Avery as doing it because he looked just like the guy who actually did it. Now, it turned out Avery was a serial killer. He, wasn't, he didn't do that crime, but he was a serial killer, regardless of what his defense lawyer says. Um, and in this case, Doug De Silva could still be the killer of Julie Ferguson. We don't know that he didn't kill Julie. We just don't know that he did. Um, he didn't do the other two, <laughs> you know. But then who killed Valerie Lamonson? I don't know. Nobody's ever gotten on that crime. You can't even hardly find any information about that crime out there. Uh, it's really sad. Um, you know, <laughs> it's it's nuts. It's just a, it's a, just a nutty thing to think how many suspects there were in this crime. Um, Joe says, can you imagine this is a film script? It will be tossed in the trash amidst much laughter for being too far fetched. Yeah. This is actually one of those where you go, oh, come on now, you know, yeah. Um, but it would make a good, maybe I'll just write a fiction book on this and that way I won't have to think about <laughs> a good story. <laughs> and actually that's how a lot of writers do it. You know, you, you, you know a story like this and then you just create a fictionalized story of it and it makes for a good story. Uh, maybe I'll do that. And uh, if you haven't seen my show, you'll buy the book, you'll be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> but by the way, if you, by the way, that is though part of my book, The Profiler, because um, I say this is one of the earliest cases I ever worked. Um, uh, yeah, way, way in the beginning, the Darlene Crashaw case, which was the last video I did, and this uh, this case. Uh, you know, I worked for families. I didn't work with the police. Um, and but it, one of the reasons I wrote the Profiler book, and I've gotten attacked for that book a lot because they're like, well. You know, you're not like the FBI profilers, you know, they're, they're these brilliant profilers and they say all these things and they all they sound like they know, like everything is perfect. They get everything right. The FBI knows what they're doing. All profilers can get inside the minds of the killer. And, and they always make it seem like they got the guy, even though they actually never are part of the people who actually found the guy. <laughs> you know, um, I like to show things realistically. So I was showing how things really work in these cases. And you know, and that's what makes things so difficult. But if you're going to be a detective or a profiler or in any sense work on things like this, you ought to know how things actually go down, um, what to expect. And when you, you know, you're working on a case, you've got somebody, you know, darn sure this is a good suspect and then it isn't. Um, now, if you ask him why, why Julie was killed, it was not a sexual homicide. So, the police theory was it was somebody who was angry with her. And yes, it does look more like a person who she would not date. And therefore he's pissed at her. That would be more logical. However, on the other hand, sometimes sexual homicides don't include actual rape. They can, like in Brenda Robinson's case, it was masturbation. It wasn't rape. And that's why she thought, geez, you did all this for that. <laughs> you know, really dude. Um, so sometimes that doesn't include an actual penetration. Um, and also sometimes people are interrupted. They, they were planning to do something and something didn't go right. They get interrupted. So you cannot take sexual homicide off the table. But in this case, it may not, may not have been the motive of the crime since apparently everybody wanted to date Julie and she wasn't going for a good portion of them because they were creepy. And so maybe somebody just was more of a stalker type. Uh, I tend to lean toward that that a stalker type wanted to have that opportunity to be with her, even for one moment. Because stalkers will kill you without actually committing a sexual homicide. They'll just shoot you or stab you or whatever, just for that moment of I'm the last person she will ever be with. Um, and any of these guys that had a thing for her, if they pulled up while she was waiting for her friends, she might... You know, she might even think they're a little creepy, but on the other hand, they're just teens. You know what I mean? They're people she's seen around and they're like, hey, why don't you sit down and talk to me for just a sec, Julie? And she's like, okay, fine, I'll talk to you. She sits down. She's not expecting the guy to hit, put his foot on the gas and drive off with her and then kill her. 
you know, so a lot of times, again, people trying to be nice and she's supposed to be a really nice girl instead of saying, I don't need to talk to you, you know, no, thank you. I'm not getting in your car. I have no reason to get in your car. She might not want to be offensive. Oh, I shouldn't be so mean. I should, well, do you, what, what are you saying, Julie? You're afraid of me? You're telling me I, I'm scary? And then you're like, oh, no, no, I didn't mean that. Well, come and sit in the car then. And then she sits in the car because she doesn't want to offend. Let me tell you, ladies, be offensive. <laughs> you know, if a guy has respect for you, he will understand that if you are nervous around him, you have a right to be nervous. And when he says, don't you trust me? The answer should be no. I trust my mother. I don't trust you. And anybody who says that, I don't expect anybody to trust me. I, if they're nervous around me, I don't go, what, don't you trust me? Why should you trust me? Do you know me well enough to trust me? You know, my granddaughter trusts me. My kids trust me. My good friends trust me. But, you know, I don't expect everybody to trust me. And I'm a female, you know, I'm an older female. And I, I really shouldn't be that scary. <laughs> Maybe I am. But, you know, no, you don't have to trust anybody. Well, let me take your thing. Let me carry your stuff up to your apartment and, and help you put it in your kitchen. And you have to let the guy in the door and you don't want him to do that. And he says, come on, you can't just, you can't not trust everybody. I'm just trying to help you. No, oh, I don't want to be, I don't want to insult you. Sure, help me out. And then you get killed. You know, you don't have to trust people you don't know. You don't have to be that nice to them. You can simply say, yes, you, it makes me uncomfortable. Sorry if it makes you feel that way. I'll see you at school. But I'm going to guess she didn't. She sat in his car because she didn't want to be rude or offensive to that, whomever, whoever that person was. I personally do not believe she was pulled into the vehicle. I, I don't think, I don't think she, I don't think a gun was pointed at her. Um, I don't, I think she sat in the vehicle on her own because of the way things are sitting because of the bags on the sidewalk and the drink. I don't think she was pulled into the vehicle. I think she sat in there thinking the door was open and her, and her friends were going to pull up in a second. She was just going to talk to whomever, whoever was in the car. And the guy pulled away, just hit the gas and took her off. That's what I believe happened, but I don't know who it was. Do I think it was Doug De Silva? I'm less likely to think it's Doug De Silva because she did not know him. Um, I think it's one of the guys that had a thing for her. That would be my best guess at this crime. Um, and it probably wasn't my Scrabble friend. <laughs> Could have been a son, but I don't know. Son. I don't know what happened with the son. Um, but I personally don't think it was probably not one of the fathers. Although that could be, she a father could have pulled up just to chat with her, and she could he could say, "Come on and sit with me." So it could have been one of them. See, it's hard to get rid of everybody. Uh, Doug De Silva actually is probably the least likely sus suspect, in spite of everything about him. I would go with, I would go with one of the guys or a father of a friend. So um, that's where I would, I would stay with. Um, <laughs> oh, do it, Pat. It'll be a great reader. I, and Christine, I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle of like three other books that I haven't finished. I'm like, I'm like 50% done, but I, I never, I have to get that finished up. So um, <laughs> um, Annika says, Julie is an example of how many dangerous people a young woman is surrounded by at any given moment. Isn't this true and crazy? Because I'm, Greenbelt, Maryland, by the way, it's not a bad area. I mean, I'm not talking about this is not a trashy area. This is a fairly nice area. I mean, I've lived, I, my, my, my kids grew up around there for 35, I lived there 35 years. Um, we had a uh, right next door in our little town, right right against Greenbelt. Um, we had a great boys and girls club. We paid, played ball with the boy, uh, Greenbelt Boys and Girls Club. Uh, most of my kids' friends went to Greenbelt schools. Um, we went, we had shopped there. We, there's a, the Greenbelt uh, uh, Park is there. It's a gorgeous park. There's, there's another gorgeous park, uh, park with a lake in it. You walk around and, and the Greenbelt Center, the town center is cute. It's got like an old fashioned theater in there and a little cute little restaurant. It's a great place. But yet <laughs> there's some not so great people there. Not so great. Um, yeah, it is terrifying. Hmm. Um, you think it's premeditated or just a random person driving around? Um, I think it was premeditated. Uh, I don't think it was just anybody. No, I think I think they have suspects that know Julie. I don't think this is just a serial killer rolling through. No. Although I wanted to point out to people, 
Well, then they go, how did she get pulled? How did she disappear out of a shopping center where people are coming and going? And one of the problems with serial killers is you only need that second of opportunity. So you don't, you know, you might, there might be a serial killer who does drive around, goes past this place looking. He looked, he looked on Monday night and didn't see anybody. And then he looked again on Tuesday night and Wednesday night and Thursday night. And there were always too many people around. And on Friday night, he comes through and there's just one girl and there's nobody else in sight for that two minutes. And so he leans out and says, hey, and she's gone. I don't think that's what happened, but a serial killer does troll areas um, and uh, look for people. And he might do that quite often until he gets that one moment where nobody's looking. So clearly, even though there are people that said she was leaning into a car, some people said she was talking to these three people in his red vehicle. Nobody saw her get into the red vehicle. They just saw her supposedly talking to somebody like through the door. Um, so I don't know. Could it have been a vehicle with three people in it that grabbed her? Yes. But I just don't, I don't understand that, you know, this girl wasn't into, as far as I know, wasn't into drugs. She wasn't a drug dealer. I mean, why would three people take her to go kill her? I mean, I, I don't see there's a lot of evidence for that. I mean, yeah, that's kind of just weird. You know, I find that unlikely. Uh, but I think more likely a stalker type, uh, a guy who wanted her and didn't get her. Um, maybe she was too much of that perfect girl, you know, where she's the one that you, uh, the, the guy who's messed up <laughs> always wants because she's that much above him. You know what I mean? So, and she always does say no, now, she's not going to go out with a creep. So she's like, no, I'm not going out with you. And he's like, you think you're better than me. And then you keeps having a thing for her and she will never give him the time of day. Uh, that's what I would tend to say. Uh, that's what I would tend to think is most likely. But as you can see, we have a long suspect list. Uh, the police have spent 1995. This is now, I'm trying to say, 17 years now? 20, no, 20, 1995, 2005, 2015. It's all 27 years. Yeah, 27 years unsolved case. Um, uh, and they tried. I mean, they did try. I mean... I don't know how much they followed up on my tips. I mean, I turned things into them. I don't know if they just dumped them in a trash can or, or they followed them up. And I hope they did, you know, uh, because I thought they were at least reasonable tips. Um, but they've had a, if, if you look at these shows, you see how many detectives are talking about this case. So there's so many that worked on it. I think, I think it's, I'm not sure if it started out with Greenbelt police, but went to Prince George's County, uh, uh, homicide department, um, major crimes. Um, <clears throat> And now it's a cold, it's with cold case in Prince George's County. Um, and they're still trying. And, you know, I think they think it's the, the Noel Smith guy um, at this point. At least I think one guy thinks that. So this is a problem. Sometimes you'll have a guy just, I know that Doug De Silva, one of the earlier detectives, were absolutely sure it was Doug De Silva. He was like zeroed in on that guy. And I think some are zeroed in on, on this Noel Smith guy. And I think, who knows? Behind the scenes, there may be somebody who's zeroed in on this creepy guy who goes, we are killing Julie. Maybe it's the Victor guy or maybe you know, by another name. Um, and I can't get the guy's name. I do have the guy's name. Um, uh, and I say they have the guy's name. So I don't know. I don't know who they're looking at um, or whether three different detectives are looking at three different suspects and each one of them thinks their guy is the guy. I don't know. So um Joe says, I had my honeymoon in Maryland. Really? Who the heck goes to Maryland for a honeymoon? <laughs> my ex-wife is from there. Seemed like a nice enough place, but bad people exist everywhere. Yeah. Uh, honeymoon in Maryland. <laughs> okay. Better suggestion next time you get married. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, I live in a nice neighborhood. I mean, I, I live in a good neighborhood, but P Prince George's County, uh, of all the counties around Washington, D.C., Montgomery County is considered the best county and PG County has always been considered. Okay. We are considered more crime ridden <laughs> and we're considered the lesser County, like the sad cousin or something. Um, as a matter of fact, we always call ourselves PG. If you live in Maryland and you live in PG, you know, I'm talking about PG. And then, then we got these new people in the government and uh, they're like, Oh, we don't call it PG. We call it Prince George's. And so they're trying to push the population to say Prince George's to make our, 
our, our county sound better, but most of us still say PG. <laughs> oh my gosh. So, you know, um, yeah, where's PG County? You know, and uh, yeah, we have, we do have areas that are high crime areas. This is true. Um, anybody lives around here, they'll know Palmer Park, District Heights, Suitland. Um, they're, they're rougher areas. Uh, I live in Bowie, Maryland right now, which is uh, considered, I think it, up until at least recently, it was a, uh, the richest uh, African-American community in the United States. Um, I've also lived uh, near, near Greenbelt in a, a t beautiful little town of just a thousand people. And, you know, uh, we did have a murder there too, which got me involved in profiling. But, you know, but generally speaking, wonderful small town. Every, I mean, it's not small town. We're suburban, we're suburban people. This is, it's not like small town in the farmlands. It's, this is all suburbs of Washington, D.C. So, you know, um, so yeah, it's just suburbs. We're just, we're just a fairly nice suburban area and Greenbelt's a fairly nice suburban area that some not so great people lived there. Some crazy people. So yeah. Um, but, oh, Joe says my ex-wife's very wealthy uncle and aunt lived there. So we borrowed their mansion for a week. Oh, okay. Hey, was it in Montgomery County or in Prince George's County? <laughs> That's it. <laughs> we had no money. Yeah, I, I know that kind of uh, <clears throat> honeymoon. Yeah, you know, I, I know I know the poverty stricken first marriage and when I first got married. And, yeah, same thing. You know, um, uh, yes, this is uh, no camera. Anne says no cameras outside in those days. Yeah, today maybe it would have been harder to get away with it that easily. This is true. Um, I'm sorry, got back from playing cricket. Ah, oh, Martin's off playing cricket. Well, now you now you have to start all over again. Uh, Annika says, it's okay, Joy. Honeymoon in Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. <laughs> we can all get bad honeymoon stories now. Um, uh, yeah, but uh, uh, the point about um, the cameras, what a game changer. Cam DNA and cameras, um, two of the hugest game changers in crime solving. Because as much as we would all like to believe the FBI stories, how you can get inside the mind of a killer and then you'll know exactly where he is and what he looks like and what he does for a hobby. Bull. You know, you're not going to be able to do that. You're going to have to do solid, hard uh, police work, look at real solid evidence and connect it to things. And then cameras change everything. They can, they can, you know, especially because we have so many now, um, even, uh, even uh, like in India, there's some really good shows on Netflix. I'm watching Delhi crime for the second season. Um, that's a fictional one, but, uh, the cameras that they have all over uh, India too. So what happens is you can track cars, you can track people, you can get good, you can just get sometimes even from right from the crime scene, you can get a you know, crime scene photo from inside the house to outside the house to down the street to down at the nearest convenience store. And then all the other cameras that are in there and you can track all the way from one end to the other. So that's great. DNA is also fabulous and touch DNA the newest one is got its positives and negatives positive because when you don't have a sexual homicide, it helps to have some kind of DNA uh, that you can maybe connect somebody to the crime. Um, but you gotta be careful with touch DNA because uh, touch DNA can very easily be transferred from one object to another. And you don't want to let's say if they got touch DNA and Julie, she's a, to a high school student, God knows, she may have touched 30 different people in that, that class, you know, in the school that day. Um, everybody jumping all over, hugging each other and stuff. Every every guy's DNA may be on her clothing. So, and she wasn't sexually assaulted. So it gets a little tricky there, but you gotta be careful with it, but it can be a real game changer on the other hand. Um, what else am I watching on Netflix? I, I well, I, <laughs> I'm watching Delhi Crime. That That's my newest one. And I'm also watching, um, because it's just a super fun show. Uh, hold on a second, I'll tell you what it is. Uh, because I just blanked on the name. Um, it is, eh, it is, it's a, um, it's a Korean show about an autistic lawyer. <laughs> and it's really a sweet show and it's fun. And some of the cases are, are amusing too. It's called Extraordinary Attorney Woo, W-O-O. And I like it, it's, it's a fun show. So those are my two right now, you know, uh, Delhi Crime and the extraordinary uh, attorney Wu. And what I like about Delhi crime, it's a fictional show, but what they're showing there is, you know, things do not go so 
smoothly. And I love it when they show how difficult sometimes things are, are um, because not everybody's honorable. Uh, leaks go out to the media. Uh, the media turns on you. It's just really interesting that it's just such a rough ride sometimes for the police the detectives who are on these cases. And the public is frustrated. The families are frustrated. The police are frustrated. Nobody trusts anybody because everybody is keeping something to themselves and therefore think, thinking the other person is lying. And it makes things really, really, really difficult. Oh, you know that one. Ah, Lisa likes it too. Isn't it cute? It's really sweet. It's really sweet. I, I like that one a lot. Um, oh, yeah. I watch K dramas as well. I'll start it. Thanks. Okay, I'll get this. Okay, this is this is not crime, but I'll throw this one out. Um, Crash Landing on You is my favorite K drama, um, and the other one I just adore, which is a crime one, is called Tunnel, and it's done. The there's a Thai version and there's a Korean version. It's called Tunnel. I like the Thai version, and a guy goes. What does happen? It goes back to the goes from the past to the future uh, through a tunnel to, and he's chasing a killer and, and a serial killer and he goes through a tunnel and he ends up in the future and it's quite funny because he has no idea what all the machinery is <laughs> and, and he's in the same police station he worked in but now he's it's a great it's a great show so tunnel it's, I like the tie version so if you put in I think I think I'm not sure if tunnel is also on Netflix I saw it free so uh, so look up Tunnel and then put Thailand, and that's my favorite one. But you can also see the Korean version if you so choose. But yeah, the the movie version it's it's the it, it's not a movie version. It's a, it's a series. It's a it's a whole series. I mean, I'm looking here. Let me look look for the one on uh, Tunnel. Uh, okay, this one is Tunnel. Let me see if this is the Korean version or the. Oh no, is this a? Wait a minute. Let me see if it says Thailand here. I think this is the Thai version. Oh, is that him? But the Thai version is fantastic. Yeah, it's on. It's on Netflix. Yeah. I think this is it. Hold on. I, the one thing that drives me crazy about. Um, hold on, I gotta look at this for a second here. Um, they they don't give you enough information about the show. And let me see if this is the one I like. Oh yeah. Oh, this is it. Yes. Tunnel. Okay. Tunnel. Tunnel, just T U N N E L. It is the Thai version. It's on Netflix. It's um, a really fascinating crime series. Um, 16 episodes. The guy's very cute. <laughs> Gotta add that in. Uh, it's just really good. I really like Tunnel. Um, oh, yeah, do, do, the, do the Thai drama on Netflix. I don't know about the movie, but um, oh, there's another one. That's a mother. The twist. Oh, okay. All right. I'll check that one out. You know, I'm a big Bollywood fan, so I usually I do a lot of uh, stuff out of India. Um, and I do want to point out again, uh, because I think it's one of the best series. Um, uh, and that is on, I think that is also in Indian. Oh, what, what the heck was it called? Oh, crime. It's called Crime Stories, India Detectives. Um, it's only got one season. There's four shows. That's on Netflix. And that is fascinating. It really shows you how the, the CTV works. Amazing in, in these stories. Uh, first one is, um, uh, it, they're, four, they're four real stories. This is, these are real stories. This, uh, this is not, uh, they're not fictional. So these are the real Indian detectives in the homicide department. But they're using a lot of CTV, um, uh, CCTV. And the CCTV is just, just it's fascinating. So put that one on there. Crime Stories, India, Detectives. Really, really good. So anyway... Um, do I like any of the crime series from Scandinavia? I did watch, uh, you know, the famous one, <laughs> the, the three part one, uh, um, the fiction one. Why am I blanking on the name of it? But that's the only ones I've really seen so far. <laughs> but they got married, the stars of Crash Landing. Oh, really? <laughs> I love Crash Landing. That's great. <laughs> oh my goodness, the bridge, the bridge. Hmm. I don't know. Now you got me all. The, I got all these things I got to watch now. But I got to finish the, the the rain. Oh yeah, the girl. With the, yeah, the girl with the dragon tattoo. Uh, I don't usually like this kind of fictional stuff and the sadistic stuff, but that was really good. Uh, the three, the the three done 
um, the three Don that were, who did that? Was it Sweden that did that one? But anyway, the one from Scandinavia is great. The American one I wanted to punch in the face. So I hated the American version. So there, <laughs> the, okay, so many, so many things to watch. Oh my goodness. Yes. Mm, okay. <laughs> we end our shows <laughs> after we do all these horrifying things on, on homicide. Then we end our shows talking about uh, television and, uh, but the, you know, some of these are really good and, uh, you know, I appreciate good writing. I'm a very bad critic. I mean, or maybe it's just a strong critic of a lot of stuff. I think a lot of stuff is just garbage. It makes me roll my eyes. So, um, because I, do, I don't like poor writing and poor writing really ticks me off. So I want something, well, you know, I want, I just, uh, some of these moves are so stupid, especially about serial killers. I just, I can't even stomach them. They're, they're just too dumb. So, but those are my favorites so far. So. I should put them all down below. I'll do that. I'll put them below my favorite, my favorite ones, my favorite series. <laughs> you want something to watch besides me. So the killing, That's the killing. I'm not sure which, is, which one this is. Uh, I'm not sure. Anyway. All right. So that's it for today. Uh, I thought this was just a really fascinating, I didn't realize uh, Paula Zahn had done this on the, uh, uh, this, this on the case show. I used to do a lot of stuff with Paula Zahn. Um, I didn't realize she I didn't realize she had a whole bunch of uh, these cases. Um, so I'm curious to see if she's got other cases that I've actually worked on or no. But it was interesting to see there that version. But it was just such a mild version compared to what I knew from behind the scenes. How much more crazy it really was, especially with Doug Da Silva. And I swear to God, when he told us when he sat there with those detectives and said, <laughs> "Tell Betty Crashock sorry about her daughter Darlene." I mean, they just like, how do you know? the crash rocks. And then they lived on Daisy Lane. You just can't make this stuff up. You know what I mean? It's like coincidences do occur. And, and you got to know that. So, you know, when you're going looking at a case and you think you're able to link A, B, C, and D, it doesn't mean they're actually linked. So you have to be very careful. That's why even in profiling and um, crime scene analysis, it, you can't really say you figured it out till you actually have the evidence to prove it because Weird stuff happens and, and you can't jump to conclusions at all. So, um, oh, you're most welcome, Ann. <laughs> Good night, everybody as well. <laughs> Thanks, Pat. This was so interesting. So many suspects. Yeah, C Christine, you weren't one of them. So there you go. <laughs> I, I could have been one of them. I lived in the area. So who knows? But uh, anyway, thank you, everybody, for being here um, and look forward to seeing you next time. And I think I'm going to do a I'm thinking of doing a call in this week. So if you're here right now uh, and you want to be part of the call in, uh, send me over two cases you'd really, really want to discuss. And I'll see if I can put together a call in this week uh, and we'll have fun with that. So um, until then, I do hope to see you. Uh, see you around. Bye. <music>